my name is Carla de La Paz. And my name is Katerina Kotechka. And welcome to the very first episode of The Rundown. Now we have a pretty jam-packed show today. We'll be taking a look at aerial yoga with a lovely Katerina next to me. <laughs> Our field reporter Momina will be taking a look at Latrobe's newest coffee shop, House of Cars Espresso. And we'll be also taking a look at Bodyworks Vital. But first, let's have a look at the news headlines. It's been a big couple of days in federal politics. Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull managed to survive a vote on his leadership with his long-term minister Peter Dutton emerging as his challenger. Malcolm Turnbull won the votes 48 to 35 in an internal Liberal Party vote that took place amid a backbench uprising. As opinion polls show, the government was heading for a heavy election defeat. Following the political challenge, Malcolm Turnbull is now facing a political crisis as he clings on to for power in the wake of at least 10 front benches having offered their resignation to the PM. Mr Turnbull refused their offers, hoping instead to heal the wounds. Amid all the leadership drama, Julia Bishop, who was this morning's re-elected as the party's deputy leader, was asked if she would consider running to offer as an offer alternative to both Mr Turnbull and Mr Dutton. She maintains that she is sticking by the Turnbull government, while Mr Dutton hints that he will challenge Mr Turnbull for the Liberal leadership again. Melbourne's newest Archbishop, Peter Comsoli, has voiced his strong commitment to reporting sexual abuse reports involving the church immediately to the appropriate authorities and is already taking steps to a brighter future. Accompanying the Archbishop's statements, Pope Francis recently wrote an open letter to all Catholics apologising for the abuse claims throughout the years involving members of the church. It came a week after a grand jury in Pennsylvania in the US reported at least 1,000 children were victims of some 300 priests over the past 70 years, as quoted by the ABC. Pope Francis apologised on behalf of the church for protecting those in power and turning a blind eye to the vulnerable. The Archbishop and Pope Francis's statements have been welcomed by the Australian Catholic Bishops' Conference. As quoted by the ABC, the Australian Bishops' Conference have said that these are important words from Pope Francis, but words are not enough. Now is the time for action on many levels. A man has been charged over the murder of a young father after a local firefighter discovered the burning body of a 23-year-old, Wade Still, on the side of a road in, New in Newcastle at 1am 1 1 on Monday. According to Newcastle Herald, the firefighter described the situation as haunting and claims that there, were very, there was a very strong smell of petrol where the man was found screaming in agony and begging for his life. Overnight, police have charged a 35-year-old man with the murder of Wade Still and an official statement from the police alleges that the two men actually knew each other. However, police are still investigating the circumstances surrounding the incident. The 35-year-old was refused bail and will face a Newcastle local court today. Australian travel giant's flight centre has been accused of ripping off customers and underpaying staff, some of whom say working at the company was like being in a cult. According to ABC News investigators, a dozen of current and former staff have claimed the agency encourages its travel consultants to gouge customers by adding hundreds and sometimes thousands of dollars to bookings. Past and present staff have said that the $6.7 billion company is built on a work hard, play hard alcohol fueled culture that grinds staff down with miserable pay and excessive unpaid overtime hours. Staff have further detailed how reserving a flight for a customer and then manually adding an extra amount to the booking in Flight Centre's online system, ranging from as little as $30 to hundreds or even thousands of dollars before revealing the total price to the customer. The Fair Works in Busman is now undertaking an investigation into how Flight Centre says pays its staff. In entertainment, Hollywood has pretty much blacklisted Kevin Spacey in the light of the multiple allegations of sexual assault against him. He was dropped by his talent agency, booted from House of Cards and edited out of all the money in the world after the scandal broke and now his first film since the accusations against him surfaced, Billionaire's Boy Club. It has only made $126 on opening night and at least 400 to date. According to The Hollywood Reporter, the average movie ticket costs just under $10, which means fewer than 20 people across the country went to see the, his movie when it debuted on Friday. So That's pretty um, intense that he only made $425, uh, $100, did you say, on the US box office? I mean... It, it doesn't surprise me, considering the uh, accusations that have been um, put towards Kevin Spacey. I'm just surprised that they even went ahead and did the film because it just seems pointless. It was The trailer looks like it was going to be a very good movie, 
but it was made two years ago before the allegations came out against Kevin Spacey. Ah, okay. So, releasing it was a tough call because there were so many other people who worked on the movie Yeah. that it seems a little unfair as a person that goes to the movies, you sort of feel bad going in and watching it because it's in it, but then... It's yeah. a good movie. Yeah, and I know what you mean, because, I, I mean, well before all these allegations came out, like, I was a massive fan of Kevin Spacey, so it really disappointed me when I heard all the news about him and the allegations made against him. I think it's just sort of disappointing, because it's, it's sad when you find out that someone that you really looked up to did something so terrible. And, um, yeah, it just doesn't surprise me that the film didn't do well. And like you said, apparently it's meant to be a really good movie, but obviously audiences are not... Um, not impressed with him and probably don't want to support him at all. So it's just, um, yeah, it's not it's not good. I feel very bad for the other people that worked on this movie because they put so much effort and there's big names, yeah. big names attached to this movie. So it's sort of unfair, but... Yeah, I mean, because they're working yeah. just as hard as well and they've done absolutely... They haven't done anything wrong and because of, I guess, Kevin Spacey, um, a lot of their work's getting thrown in the bin, <laughs> which is unfortunate because I, I know if I was an actor on a, on a movie and that happened, I'd be pretty bummed out as well because, you know, you you want your work recognised, but unfortunately um, it's not the case for, um, what was it called? Billionaire, billionaire, billionaire billionaire's Boys, Boys Club. Club. Okay, yeah. Um, but to make a movie, it's so much effort in the people behind the scenes, yeah. editing, it, not even just the actors, directors, writers, it's a lot of effort. Yeah. And our first story today is about yoga. I tried something that's a physical, mental and spiritual practice known as yoga and combine that with silk hammock, you've got anti-gravity yoga. This week I attended a class at Mindful Yoga Studios and caught up with Nicole Cleaver, the owner of the studio. It was a very interesting experience. (laughs) Let's have a look. Hi, my name's Katerina and today we're down at Mindful Yoga Studio. Today I'm about to participate in something I've never done before, aerial yoga. Mindful Yoga Studio, um, where we run aerial classes, reformer, and mat yoga. Aerial yoga, it's um, anti-gravity yoga, is basically was invented by Christopher Harrison, so a guy in the States, and it's really about um, how you can go upside down into those zero compression inversions with what like, being assisted in the hammock. And then everything else that comes from it is just that added extra. It's, you know, you still, you get the stretching and the releasing of muscles and stuff. But for me, I also find yoga is a beautiful, mindful practice. You know, it's really about, we're all so busy in the world. We're all rushing and running and racing to do things. Like no one's ever taking that moment just to stop and let go. So that's what I use yoga for is a time for you know for you to be able to shut your system down so that your mind can have a chance to relax and release you know and then the body gets a chance to really relax and release and look, it doesn't matter how old you are I have a lady in my classes who's 69 she comes here she does our flying shoulder stands so she's yeah she's she's great so it's ageless with an open mind so be ready to you know if you can let go of your fear and beliefs and just trust in the hammock, then you'll have an amazing experience. Wow, Katarina, look at you go. You look so composed. It was so much fun. <laughs> like, I walked in so nervous. I was like, I oh, can my imagine. God, I'm going to, like, break my neck. Yeah, but, but let us know. How did you How did you find it? I mean, aerial yoga, like, I've never heard of it. So tell me how it went. It's so interesting. And it's, like, so much more than just having fun. You're like a child on swing, practically. But Aww, you need awesome. so much core work and, yeah. like, trust in yourself that you won't fall. Yeah. And uh, then Cole was great. She was... She looked... She, she looked was amazing. She was so great. She helped. She made you feel calm. Yeah. Because I got there and I stood and I looked up and I was like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurt myself. <laughs> It was 
very interesting. I recommend it to anyone. It was great. Yeah, and you said that like your your core, your body was just aching. Yeah, because you, you're sort of hanging upside down, <laughs> and you need to get yourself up. <laughs> I couldn't. Ima- I couldn't do it. I was. It's, I was. I, I saw that, and I was like, I know that I'm not that flexible. So there is no way that I There's so would much benefits to yoga itself. Yeah. Apply that with a silk hammock, and you've got a bit of fun, but a bit more extra work. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And. You said that you would recommend it. What is what is the one thing that you would recommend to people that are viewing? Like, what was the best part about it? Don't be scared to go and try it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just, and then laying in the hammock, you're very relaxed. You, you come out of it very relaxed and, like, clear-minded. Yeah. yeah. No, it sounds really cool. Well, I mean, if anyone wants to go try out aerial yoga, then go ahead. Katarina here 100% recommends it. Maybe I'll give it a go. You should. I keep writing it off and saying, I don't think I can do it, but maybe I should try it. I think I will. But anyway, let's go into our next story. Uh, next up on the show, we'll be taking a look at La Trobe University's newest instalment, House of Cards Espresso. For all you coffee junkies out there, this story might be just for you. Mamina Shakur reports. Students at La Trobe University can look forward to a new coffee hotspot at the Thomas Sherry forecourt. We spoke to the owner of House of Cards Espresso, who gave us some insight on how the cafe runs. My name's Guy and I am the owner of House of Cards Espresso. So House of Cards was a bit of a marrying of our love of coffee and also of a social enterprise of wanting to give back a little bit to the community. Daniel and I, who is another one of the owners in the back there, uh, we both study at La Trobe uh, and that's kind of where we started our career, I guess, in hospitality. What makes House of Cards unique is their monthly donation drive based on the suggestions from the customers. We ask customers or our staff to recommend organisations that they think fit into the mould uh, and then we kind of screen them, I guess, and just make sure that they, I guess, fit into what we, we believe. House of Cards donates to four different organisations, including environmental, health, cultural and social. So Shake It Up raises money for Parkinson's disease research. The environment one is the Australian Marine Conservation. For cultural, it's the Children's Book Council of Australia. And for social, it's Eat Up, which is an organisation that provides underprivileged kids with, some, with meals at school. Whenever you purchase a coffee or food item, you are given a card at which you can place in the four different charity slots. And the cafe donates according to slot percentage. I buy a coffee every day, so... It's kind of cool that a bit of it goes to helping you know people out. Really cool way of uh, handling a business, I guess, because one, this is well, we're in uni, so everyone's always looking for a course to kind of help out with. We're very much uh, involved in the whole process, so if there's something that you would like to bring to the limelight, we encourage you just to drop us a line, let us know the organisation that you would like us to donate to, um, and then we'll do do our side of things and pretty much, and it's just buy a coffee really, come down, say hello. Mamina Shakur, The Rundown. A very interesting story. Hmm. And joining us today at the desk is Mamina. Hi, Hi how are you guys? I'm good, how are yeah. you? Good. So, first, tell us, how is the coffee? Oh, it's delicious. It tastes amazing. <laughs> um, being a go- coffee junkie myself, um, I'm always up for coffee, yeah. Yeah, and I'm really excited to try it because I haven't tried it out. I've heard a lot about it. So I'm going to take your word for it that it's yeah, really good. Definitely. Give it a give it a shot, yeah. So I'm going to take your word. House of Cards Espresso. I'm going to go try out a coffee. So it's got to be 10 out of 10. <laughs> Tell us um, a bit about the House of Cards. Oh, sure thing. Um, so House of, House of Cards Espresso is a pop-up cafe um, just here in the Thomas Cherry forecourt. Um, okay. They just opened a week ago. Um, yep. And so... Um, the, it's owned by uh, Guy and Dan, which which are lovely people, um, super friendly, and they actually studied here in La Trobe, um, their undergraduate. Um, so yeah, they they help and they donate um, to um, yeah. So they donate and they help to the community each month, and they usually um, donate to four different causes: environmental, health. Um, social uh, and cultural and it differs so each course um, differs each month according um, customers can actually uh, nominate um, causes they want to help yeah that's really it's really good Um, yeah 
so it's just a great way of the customers getting involved and just helping out the community and um, just a lovely cause and a lovely cafe and really nice people. Yeah. And, you know, just grab a coffee and a, a Jaffel sandwich. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, really nice. Um, and in the story, I think Guy mentioned something that the about the coffee. He said that they source it from somewhere in particular. Yeah, so they source their coffee from Clark Street um, Coffee Okay. Roasters, yeah. Um, they're located in Mil- Melbourne, so Richmond. Um, it's, it's it's so it's helping Australian business as well, and um, House of Cards also has a unique blend. So nowhere else um, here in Melbourne or anywhere else has that blend. Um, so that'd be great. Yeah, uh, it's just a great coffee um, sourced ethically. And you're just supporting um, a local business, and it's really great. Yeah. Yeah, and I think what makes House of Cards like really different um, from, I guess, most coffee shops is the donation aspect, as you said. Do yeah. you, would you be able to give us a little rundown of what the, how the donation process sure. works, where I go to, where? Yeah. What's the story? So <laughs> when you go to purchase your coffee, um, so when you go to purchase your coffee, they give you a card from a stack of cards. Okay. And um, while you're waiting for your coffee to ma- be made, um, there's four slots. So the health, the environmental, the social, the cultural. And you just put your um, coffee in, uh, sorry, <laughs> the uh, card in one of the slots that you want to contribute to. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's just very simple, um, very fun. Mm. And um, you're supporting, obviously, um causes and helping the community out. Well, we want to thank you so much, Momina, for being here. It was lovely talking with you. Now let's look at our new next, um, sorry, our new story, Body World's Vital. Our very own Tristan Smith went out to the Melbourne showgrounds to check out something interesting. Um, The performance has shown up Body World's Vital and spoke to the director of the show. Let's take a look. For the very first time, the Melbourne showgrounds and indeed Australia are hosting Dr. Gunther von Hagen's Body Worlds exhibit. We spoke to Brent Spillane, Managing Director at XPO Exhibitions, about Body Worlds Vital. This one in particular is called Body Worlds Vital, and it explores more around uh, the health and well-being and vitality objectives that we should all be considering in terms of the lifestyle choices we're making daily. Body Worlds Vital features donated human bodies and body parts that have undergone the process of plastination a method of preservation that involves immersing the bodies in a polymer solution and allowing them to harden, ensuring that the flesh retains its natural shape and the body stays in its pose. Gunther von Hagen is the inventor of plastination and I think we should all be very thankful for the research and countless hours that he's put into this science and art form. Unfortunately, Gunther von Hagen's is, is in the advanced stages of Parkinson's disease and you've probably seen the exhibit today Um, which explores some of the radical therapy he's undergoing himself as as a scientist and he wants to really explore the ways in which he might be able to overcome illness. The bodies have been posed in a way that not only showcase the human body in action, but also provoke thought in their audience. The artistry is hard to deny, even if education is the primary focus of the exhibit. When I say art form, I believe he's really been able to portray or provoke emotion in terms of a a global audience and make the whole science and medicine around the human anatomy accessible for the public. I think clearly there's benefit in in both levels of profession, but, but this is an important area of both science and public exhibition. Art is, in fact, an important facet of the exhibition and the science behind it. Were it not for this element, the message of healthy living would not reach the audience's ear with anywhere near the amount of impact. Encouraging introspection and change is as much a worthy goal to Dr. Gunther as is educating the masses. We've had an overwhelming level of support from Australian families and the vast majority of attendees have been public schools and private schools. When children are making decisions about the kinds of lifestyles that they want to pursue, the ability to see, for instance, the the effects of smoker's lung, from heavy smoking versus a healthy lung. From, from, a, from a family perspective, this is very appropriate. Everyone will take something different out from this exhibition when you're really getting deep inside tissue or deep inside arterial functions. People either will find the beauty in that or they will see something that they're repelled by. Ultimately, this is how you and I function. So I think an understanding of that and the appreciation of how the body functions 
starts to peel away at the element of this being some macabre type of response. The more impressions that I'm getting, both from young and old, is just awe and amazement. Uh, th those, are, those are probably the more common responses when people exit, not beforehand, but certainly when they exit. This is Tristan Smith, The Rundown. For those interested, Body World's Vital is running from the 13th of August all the way to the 18th of November. So if you guys want to go check it out, then those are the times. It's located at the Melbourne Showground and looks very interesting. It really does. And I read on their website just not too long ago that apparently this show has been seen by 46 million viewers globally. That's pretty impressive. It's so. very popular and it seems so cool. It does. And um, <laughs> I would love to go. I think it's really interesting. I mean, I've never seen a Body World's Vital thing before, but I, I think mean, I might go. That looks so cool. I It looks like a great thing to have a look at. It really does. All right, now it's time for our sports update. Thank you, Ka Mitch and Kayla, for joining <laughs> us. Um, let's go into the sports segment. Um, <laughs> All right, so we had a big week in sports uh, over the last week. We had a big week in sports over the last seven days, especially over the weekend, and it was big. It was really big in, and yeah, it was um, it was in the AF in the AFL. Sorry. We had um, we had a lot of big teams coming up against a lot of other big teams in the race for the finals, and it was a, lo a lot of big results for a lot of teams. A lot of teams cemented their place in the eight ahead of September, whilst a lot of teams fell out of the way and now may miss out on finals and. Well, Mitch, it was a big week for Collingwood, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely right. Um, I think it's been a few years since they've been in, in, in the eight in, in, in September. So really exciting for the for such a big fan base as well, which is good. Um, obviously, Melbourne as well, 12 or so years without finals. So a lot of their fans. So it's been a yeah, big week, like you said, um, and a few big games to come. Look, I think the big one for the week is probably going to be Sydney Hawthorne. Um, two teams that have had a decent rivalry over probably the last half decade or so. Um, and yeah, that's really going to shape up finals, I think. Um, you know, Buddy Franklin's one of the biggest names in footy and has obviously played for both sides and done really well, so it'll be interesting to see how they go. Who do you think is going to come out victorious out of those two? Um, well, I could see Hawthorne getting up because rumours are that Franklin won't be playing this week due to, a, due to some form of injury picked up in the Sydney Derby win. But um, regardless, I would go with Hawthorne anyway. I think they're just in too good of a form to go against at the moment. And Sydney, they're coming back from a string of losses, but... I would pick them most weeks, but against Hawthorne, it's going to be it's going to be tough, even at the SCG. But another big game that we've got this week is Melbourne GWS. Two teams fighting for a home final. Essentially, GWS lost that Sydney derby, and we've got Melbourne who are coming off a huge win against the top eight side in West Coast. So, at the G, a big game for Melbourne if they want to get that home final at the G. Who have you got for this round? Yeah, look, I, you, you go off GWS at the moment, probably, you know, injury riddled, I'd say. But I'd, to be honest, they're still my tip for the premiership. You know, I think they're a bit behind at the moment. But if they can get numbers back and obviously the week in between uh, round 23 and, and finals, that week break is certainly going to help them out. So, look, a win this week would certainly help boost their confidence as well. Uh, I think Josh Kelly, obviously, probably the biggest name at the club at the moment. Um, still question marks, but he's set to make his return for the week. Melbourne, obviously, very big confidence booster. Um, there's obviously been a lot of talk about how their celebrations were after um, Sunday's game, but I think it was well-deserved from them um, getting the club back into the finals and hopefully there's no hangover from the week. But, um, no, I think it's going to be a tight game and I, I do see GWS coming out on top, uh, but I think it's definitely going to be a close one. And you say that GWS will come out on top, not just this round, but in the season altogether, winning the flag... Do you think their injury list may get get the best of them come September? I mean, it's it's a grueling period of the season. It's one where they need as many bodies as ready as they can. Do you think that they may struggle come September with all these injuries? Yeah, I think you look probably 12 months ago, they had a, they had a similar issue. Uh, I think it was close to half their best list were away for most of the season. Um, but and they in that obviously in that prelim against Richmond, um, you know, obviously Richmond going off last year at the MCG probably just you know undefeatable. But um, Look, I think it's obviously not as bad as last year. They've probably had a stronger group this year as well. Um, I think they've just dropped a couple of games that they could have won or, could have, or really just shouldn't have lost to some of the lower sides in the league. So I think when it comes finals, they've, they've always done pretty well against the top eight. And I think, yeah, they'll, they'll take it the distance. And it's very bold saying that given that Richmond, uh, as you say, almost undefeatable at this stage. And at the G, they're going to have at least one home final. And, you know, they've got that unbeaten record at the G that extends to nearly 20 games. How do you feel? How do you feel about Richmond not going all the way after 
their superior season and obviously their finals run last year. Yeah, exactly. 20 games in a row at the G, it's, it's a standing record. Um, and obviously going to finals last year, played every single game there and, and you know didn't look a drop off um, off top spots. So it'll be interesting to see how they go. Um, I don't think they're going to cop any pressure at all. Um, obviously, they, everyone is looking at them, but they look at like a side that's, that's done it all year and taken it on really well and thrived on the pressure. But another team that has recently fallen under was Arsenal um, in the Premier League. You know, they've started mm. with two losses the first time, I think, since 1986 that they've done that. So under new coach Unai Emery, um, against Chelsea and City, though, so two of the harder competitions. How have you found their start so far? Well, as an Arsenal fan, I've been disappointed, to say the least, but going into a new era with Emery as the head coach, it was always going to be a transition period, and I think that they're still in this at the moment. And obviously, there's a lot of new players at the club. You've got players like Matteo Guendouzi, Lucas Torreira, and also Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, who's in his first full season at the Gunners. And they're going to take a little bit of time to gel, I think, but give them a few more weeks and they'll be back up in the top half of the table. They're currently, I think they're currently in the relegation period or the relegation stage of the table. So it's going to be tough with the new coach and with the new players coming in. But I think that they've got the personnel to do it. But again, it's just getting out of that transition period and really for finding some really solid form. Another team that suffered at the weekend was Manchester United. Now, they did come out 3-2 losers in that loss to, in that game against Brighton, or, and it was it was tough. It really was tough because Brighton did catch them off guard in that two-minute period where they scored a couple of goals, and, well, it's it's tough. A lot of people are having to go at Mourinho. Do you feel the same way? Look, I, it's it's probably the hardest job in football, sometimes being coach of Manchester United, the biggest, arguably the biggest club in the world, and a start like that, especially going 3-1 down at halftime, that hasn't happened to Manchester in, in, since, since I can remember, but look, he's, he's had a lot of pressure put on him recently, and I think, obviously, you're going off the form of, of their start to the years, um, it's, it's really struggling. You look at the, the players that Brighton have, it's not this all-star team, it was only the first year back in the Premier League last season, and play like Glenn Murray, putting something past De Gea like he did at 35 years old. Um, it, it, you, you can kind of question, you know, the defence just fell apart against someone like him and they've got Harry Kane against Tottenham next Tuesday, who's probably one of the best strikers in the world. But um, moving on to uh, to Tottenham, uh, look, uh, Daly Alley in the week's kind of blown up at the moment. He uh, uh, There was a little celebration he did on on the weekend and with his little challenge uh, and it's kind of blown up and I, I, I can't do it to save myself. I think you, you have to kind of do that. <laughs> uh, any, any luck there, Callum, with yourself? Yeah, it's, um, it, is, it is tough and I've been, I've been working at it prior to recording just trying to get it right and uh, I think I might have got it. Uh, I, think <laughs> I can was, see you, and, and I have saw, no we idea saw, how we saw, I would in, go we saw about it in play that. in the AFL during the I way during the week, and I think it's probably best that we all have a go. You all have a full favour. I have to learn. Okay. What we've been told, so I think it's a bit like I'm trying to remember. It's like the, the emoji. It's the emoji signal, okay. like that. Yeah. We'll get it on the camera, so like that, <laughs> and then then fingers you push it down like that. You get your three fingers pushed down, push your push your pointer finger up, and then up like that. Just through. Am I, doing it? Am I doing it? I think she's doing all right. They're better than I can't do I've it. I've got like, nails on, so myself. it's a hazard. I could well, crack my eye. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're, you're pretty good at the moment, but it's um, it certainly has taken the world by storm, and we always see crazy things come in like this, but... I mean, as an Arsenal fan, it's a shame to see it coming from Tottenham. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I think a few Collingwood boys did it on the weekend. I believe in James... their win, so it's already, yeah, it's already come across as uh, into Australia, which is... Which, yeah, they've really blown up, but it's good to see that some of the boys are just having fun on the field. Exactly right. And sometimes sport can get a bit serious, and it's good to see them showing their lighter-hearted side and, you know, being a bit, I guess, jovial. So, um, yeah, hopefully we can... Hopefully, again, I'm not a huge fan of it as an Arsenal fan, but at the end of the day, it is something that can, I guess, bring people together and, you know, ha that way they have fun on the field and, you know, takes away the serious side of it. They feel as if they're, you know, having fun as opposed to playing in front of 100,000 people. So... Here's to seeing more Deli Alley challenges. Yeah, well, thanks you so much, guys, for coming in. It was lovely hearing about sport. It's not my area of expertise, but it's good to have these two experts here helping us out. So um, it was a pleasure having you. So unfortunately, we've hit the uh, end of the show, but we would like to thank you all for watching the very first episode of The Rundown, and we hope to see you all again next week. <laughs> Goodbye, bye. Bye. <laughs> see ya.